Well, good morning and welcome to Grace Fellowship, a church for all nations online. Folks, we are so glad that you've decided to spend a little bit of time with us, right? Absolutely. Yes, we are so excited for that. Hey, listen, Pastor Jeff is continuing his sermon series, Asking for a Friend, and we're excited about the message today because he's going to talk yeah. about uh, what what to do with the doubts that we have about God. And I'm sure it's going to be a great message. I can't wait to hear it. But before we do, we have a few things that we want to tell you today. Yeah, you know, last week was an awesome message. Yes. Pastor Jeff just did a great job and just sound biblical advice on how to forgive somebody. And we want you guys to know that, that we are here, and whenever you choose to come back to church, we are here, and we have taken incredible safety measures Absolutely. to make you feel safe, to make you feel comfortable about coming back out. We have marked off our rows, our entrances and exits. We have plenty of hand sanitizer. We have masks for you. If you don't have your own by now, we have some for you. And we're disinfecting between both of our services at 8.30 and 10 o'clock for now. In between both of those, we are disinfecting everything. Yeah. So it is clean, it is safe, and we are here. I mean, it's and like Mr. Clean. clean. That, that's right. Yeah. I mean, Like bald head and all. Ab <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I mean, it is super clean. And we just want you to feel safe to be able to come back. There's no pressure to return, but when you do, we just want you to know that we will be here and it will be clean and disinfected yeah. for you. And of course, we always have our continued online experience at 8.30, 10, and 11.30. So until uh, you return, we will be here, or you can check us out still online at 8.30, 10, and 11.30. Hey, absolutely. So of course, like you just said, we have our services every Sunday, and also we're doing things such as uh, Worship Wednesdays every single Wednesday at 10 a.m., yeah. We put out what we call Worship Wednesdays. It's just a worship moment for us to take some time and worship, worship God. Worship God, yeah. And uh, <laughs> we hope that the moments are meaningful for you. We're going to continue to do that. We have such a great team, and they're doing such a great job. Also, please don't miss Deep Dive at 5 mm -hmm. every single Wednesday at 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. with Pastor Jeff and Pastor Tony and some of our other pastors. I mean, they're just doing such an incredible yeah. job. And I don't know if you heard that sermon last week, but it's How to Forgive Others is great yeah. stuff. And they yeah. spoke a little bit more on that this past deep dive. Listen, if you haven't had an opportunity to uh, look at it, I just I highly recommend that you go check it out. They are doing such an incredible job, and it helps just bring great understanding to the topic that was just preached. Well, Pastor Lowe, you guys do an awesome job as well. Oh, just great, great music, great worship. And uh, just enjoy worshiping together with you. Amen. That's a blessing. Yeah. <laughs> so lastly, we want to talk to you about Starting Point. Yeah. Starting Point is really the on-ramp for everything grace. If you want to learn more about Grace Fellowship, you need to get into virtual Starting Point. Yeah. And that begins on Sunday, September 6th. All you need to do is go online at gogracefellowship.org forward slash starting point. You don't want to forget that forward slash, forward slash starting point. Get registered, and then after you do, we will contact you and show you all that you need to do to get involved with starting point. And you know, we would love to know where you are watching from. People are watching from all over the world, and it just encourages us to know where you're watching from. Put it in the comments below. Let us see you. Let us see you because we're looking for you. We're praying for you. Let us know where you're watching from. Well, Pastor Lowe, I believe that this ends our pre service time, and uh, service is getting ready to start. And uh, you know what? It starts now. Good morning and welcome to Grace Fellowship Online. We're really glad that you joined us today start off our time of worship singing about the greatness and the faithfulness of God. Will you join us this morning? Walk 
walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battles won you have never failed me yet Promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Faithfulness I'm still in your hands This is my
is the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I judge and I defend, suffered and crucified. This is in Descended into darkness You rose in glorious light Forever seated high I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Christ that we have in our lives it helps us to know that he is faithful he is strong, he is mighty we can trust him I count on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the way the same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you up in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. Yes, I will. I 
Sometimes when we are feeling doubt or we're feeling just heavy burden and we don't know what to say or what to do, we can call on your name, Jesus. And scripture says, in Psalm 34, that when we call on your name, you hear us, Lord, you rescue us, you deliver us. We hold on to those truths. Because as Psalm 34 also says, we have tasted and seen that you are good. So Lord, I just pray for those that are listening even right now, that you would give them a song. And if they're sitting in the valley right now, not sure if you're going to make a way for them, remind them that you are faithful and give them a song to sing. And they choose to praise you. And as we sang at the beginning of the service, if you've done it before, you can do it again. We trust you. So, Lord, we, we pause and we are still and we rest in knowing that you are God. You are on the throne. You've never failed and you never will. Yes, we will. Give you thanks. Give you praise. Give you glory. And it's in Jesus Christ's name wherever you are together, let's say it. Amen. Amen. Welcome again to Grace. We're so glad to have you here. Listen, if you are new with us, we'd love you to 
fill out our Connect card, and that's there on our app or on the website or there in the link underneath our feed. But for those of us that are regular attenders, our members, sometimes we want to just take a reflection on why we do this portion of our service. Why do we provide an opportunity to give? Here are four reasons. Giving is an act of worship. Above all else, when we as Christians give to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's a reminder that we are worshiping the Lord, saying what I have is not ultimately mine. It is yours to be used for your glory. Giving also, it carves a pathway for joy in our heart. Where our money is, that's where our love is. Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Giving also reflects Jesus Christ who gave his life for us. We are never more like Jesus than when we are giving. And finally, giving impacts people for eternity. And I want to thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity so that we can continue to serve the Lord and be missional and reach people for the Lord Jesus Christ. Even what we're doing right now, this feed and this equipment and this this broadcast and this online service, guys, this is made possible by the Lord and his work in your life and your response to him saying, I want to see lives changed for eternity. This is the sharp end of the stick for reaching people for the glory of God. So I want to thank you for your heart. Thank you for your vision to keep the main thing, the main thing. And there are three ways to give. And many of us know this, but sometimes we will review this. For those of us that are new, we can give online through our app or uh, those that are here in the house uh, through an envelope. And so we're going to take a moment. We're going to pray that the Lord would prepare our hearts for what we're going to hear today in God's word. And it may be for some of us, what we need to give is we need to give the Lord an opening in our heart and in our life to do a new thing to help us go where we need to go with the Lord Jesus. Christ. For those of us that are Christians, it may be that he's going to lead us to a new place of generosity. For some of us, it's a new place of faith altogether to realize that it's ultimately the Lord who takes care of us even in and especially in these times. So let's take a moment to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you have given what we could never buy, but what we all needed, which is the forgiveness of our sins through faith in Jesus Christ and repentance of our sins. Lord, thank you that you are the one who gave us what we have needed. Would you help us, Lord, those of us that are followers of you, would you help us to, to reflect your generosity and your, uh, your work and your other-centeredness uh, more and more every day so that you would continue to just carve a deeper path way for joy in our hearts. And for many of us that are just afraid and worried and troubled, would you just remind us that you are the one who can, who can guide us through these troubled waters and you are the one who provides for our needs. And we ask you to do a great thing in us and through us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome again to Grace Fellowship, a church for all nations online and here on campus as we continue in our new series, Asking for a Friend. Week one, we looked at the question, how do I forgive myself? Week two, last week, we looked at the question of how do I move on? How do I deal with my enemies? And today we come to the topic of doubt. I'm having doubts about the existence of God. What do I do 
help exclamation point. So those of you that are tuning in with us, I want you to know that here at Grace, we welcome questions because we believe that when we begin to question things and engage with things, some of us for the very first time or some of us for the first time in many, many years that God is at work in us. So we're going to look at how God's word leads us through uh, the questions of doubt. Now, before we go further, I want to share something with you that one of our ministry networks, uh, the Florida Baptist Convention, they, they're trying to help churches be what's called evangelistic. Evangelistic is helping people come to know who Jesus Christ is, helping people who are far from God come to know God. And last year, we just saw the Lord do a powerful work in our church. And they said, we want to share what God is doing in Grace Fellowship, a church for all nations. And so they published this article, uh, Grace Fellowship Weaves Baptism in Church Life to Create Evangelistic uh, Culture. And we want to give the Lord all the praise and the glory for what he is doing here. This was initially part of a larger study from churches that the Lord is using to reach many people for Christ. But uh, based upon what God has chosen to do among us, they wanted to do a story just on Grace Fellowship. So if you are a regular attender or a member, we share this to be an encouragement to you, and we want to give Jesus Christ all the praise and the glory. But guess what? We still have much work to do. Even in 2020, we've seen people come to Christ. There are people contacting us almost on a, a, a weekly basis saying, hey, I, I have questions. I need help. I need encouragement. Can someone please talk to me? So be encouraged. Those of you that call this place your faith home, your church family, that God is at work. And here's the really cool part. Not only is God at work in us, among us, through us, but he's also giving us an opportunity to share with other churches what the Lord has led us to do in terms of biblical strategy, not anything that tries to emotionally manipulate someone or, or anything along those lines, but to be biblically faithful and to love people no matter who they are, no matter what their background is, no matter what their current views are relating to God and the scriptures but that Christ has called us to be his ambassadors in the world. And we want to share with other churches what God is teaching us and what we're learning as a faith family. So be encouraged that God is not only at work in this place, but he's giving us an opportunity to be an encouragement for other churches because ultimately it's not just about Grace Fellowship, a church for all nations. It's about the kingdom of God. Now, speaking of outreach, I want to share with something, uh, sh share, share something with you that will be a another encouragement, especially if you uh, have young children. Grace Kids starts the first Sunday in September. September 6th, not in August, but in September, two weeks from today, we're going to start again our children's ministry during our 8.30 and our 10 a.m. on campus services. So I want to encourage you to spread the word. This may be an opportunity for you to invite some of your friends that have been watching Grace online over these past few weeks and months, and they feel that it's time for them to come and try out an on-campus service. We have a great opportunity for their children to be taught the word of God on their level so the whole family can be encouraged. So today, we're addressing the question, I'm having doubts about the existence of of God. Here's our main idea. What we want to do is identify the source or sources of our doubts and pursue our questions into the ground. There's a short little book right before the last book in the Bible, the book of Jude. It has one simple chapter, so it's literally verse 22 of chapter 1, and it contains these words, and have mercy on those who doubt. A couple of years ago, George Barna, the pollster, did a study, and they concluded that two-thirds of Christians in America, self-professing, self-identifying Christians, face doubt. And we have a, a snapshot here of the response to doubt. When you experience spiritual doubt, did you stop doing any of the following? Now, notice this. 45% of professing Christians in the U.S., when they begin to feel a profound sense and feeling of doubt, 45% um, stop attending 
worship or church services. 29% stop reading the Bible. 29% stop praying. 25% when doubt comes, uh, they stop talking with their friends or their family members about faith. And 39% none of the above. And there's the consequences of doubt. Based upon if we claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ, it's how we handle doubt and how we pursue those questions that really matters in the long term. So the consequences of doubt, Barna discovers these things. Would you say that your time of spiritual doubt has made your faith stronger, 53%, weaker, 7%, didn't change it, 28%, and 12% literally lost their faith in God? Now, before we go further, I want to distinguish between doubt and something called unbelief, or if you want to take the word a little bit further, disbelief. And here's what Elmer Towns writes all the way back in 1965. He writes these words, doubt is not unbelief. Unbelief is rebellion against evidence that we cannot or will not accept. Doubt is stumbling over a stone that we do not understand. Unbelief is kicking at a stone that we understand all too well. So helping us understand that not all doubt is unbelief. Doubt is being in the dark. Sometimes it's in the intellectual dark where we hear someone lodge a, an objection against biblical Christianity and we're not sure how to respond. In other cases, there's emotional doubt. Maybe we've encountered uh, tr profound tragedy in our life, and we, we just have these feelings of doubt as if God doesn't seem to be there. So we could say it this way, that doubt is being in the dark and desiring to be in the light, but disbelief or unbelief is knowing that you're in the dark and wanting to stay there. Now, there may be some who say, well, Pastor Jeff, what about the book of James in the New Testament, chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, and it says these words. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. In the original language, that phrase Double-minded man literally means a double-souled man, where the spirit or the psyche is literally split. It's like a Dr. Jenkel and Mr. Hyde. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, that no man can serve two masters. So the issue here in James chapter 1 is a lack of commitment to God. But there are some times when we encounter doubts, and it's not that we're not committed to God. We're just struggling on how to move forward with our commitments. And I want you to know that we will always have doubt, excuse me, we will always have questions about God. We'll never be able to fully understand God because we are not omniscient. We are not all-knowing. We don't always have all the answers, but we do have enough. We have a clear picture of who God is in his word, although we may not always have a clear picture on why God allows certain things to happen to certain people in certain ways in certain times. But just because I may not understand the workings of God always in the world doesn't mean that I don't have enough evidence to place my faith in his hand and in his heart. And some of us, especially throughout the course of these past few months, have felt like, okay, well, if, if doubt can sometimes be like a rock in our pathway, we have a video of something that happened in Tennessee uh, a while back, and this can be sort of like some of the way, of, of, the way that some of us are feeling right now. Some of us feel like if doubt is a rock in my pathway, I feel like over the past several months, it's been not just one rock, but an entire mountainside gave way, and it's literally a rock slide in my life. And you don't really prepare for a landslide or a rock slide. 
Here's what an incredible Christian leader named Richard Seib said all the way back in 16. 31 in his book, The Bruised Reed. The book speaks about God's graciousness to us that when we feel like <clears throat> the fire of our life is almost gone out, when we are a smoldering piece of flax, or when we're like a, a reed, a, a little piece of wood that's been bruised and bent, he's the one who comes alongside of us and mercifully builds us back up. And here's what he says. This is tremendous. In 1631, he writes these words. It is an office of love here in this life to take away the stones and to smooth the way to heaven. So this morning, what we're going to do as God gives us strength is to remove some stones that may be in some of our pathway as we're seeking to either find out who God is or we're already committed to him. We're not the double-souled man in James chapter 1. We're just trying to find out the best way that we can continue and work through our commitment to Jesus Christ and stay faithful in this day and time. So let's take a look at troubleshooting our doubts. Number one, we want to identify the sources of our doubts. Let's start simple. Just like if you're at, at your home and a light bulb goes out, you don't automatically call FPNL. You first try to change the light bulb, and if that doesn't work, then you try the circuit breaker and flip that back and forth, and then maybe call someone who knows what they're doing so you don't electrocute yourself unless you are an electrician uh, to check the wiring. And then after that, you go up and up and up. So let's, let's start uh, where we're going to see some of these indications in the Word of God where people have encountered incredible victories in their life as God used them, but then they also encountered extremely low points that often were associated with being completely physically and emotionally depleted. So let's first ask the question, if we begin to feel doubts rising up, do I feel physically exhausted? Now again, at the time that this sermon is being given, many of us are experiencing at certain points a lack of sleep or exercise or even a healthy diet. And know this, that physical fatigue can affect how you feel about your faith. Many people are struggling with physical exhaustion in this time. We would also ask the question, do I feel emotionally depleted? Do I have an increased or a prolonged pressure at work or home. Now, Jesus promised that we would overcome, but Jesus never promised that we would always get up every single day and feel good. This may be a great point for some of us to begin taking a Sabbath because we were not designed to run 24-7. Energy drinks can only get some of us so far. I know, I drink energy drinks from time to time, more often than I should, but we all know that whatever we do to continue going, there's also the reverse effect as well. There's going to be a crash. You say, oh, Pastor Jeff, I don't have time to take a break and rest. You may want to begin with unplugging from time to time so that you can have a mental Break. You also want to take an assessment of your life and to say, okay, it may not be that I don't have time, but it may be that I'm not managing the time that I have in the most efficient way possible. If you're the type of person that just runs by, as we say, the seat of our pants, and it's always the tyranny of the urgent, and we always feel like we are running at breakneck speed from location to location, it may be helpful to bring in another person who is skilled with time management and help you even develop develop a schedule so that you can schedule in the things that God says that you should schedule in. We should also take an inventory of our lives with our emotional stewardship. Again, in this time, we are bombarded with emotionally draining data every single day. And even if you just try to find data-driven news only, you're going to either work with relate to or be related to in in the same home with those who are uh, allowing what's going on in the world to shape and mold their emotions. And emotional fatigue is a very, very real thing. I believe that the Lord wants us to be aware to be self-controlled, but also self-aware. This is where the Bible talks about biblical discernment, seeing what's really there. And I want to showcase the Old Testament prophet 
Elijah, as we talk about emotional and physical exhaustion. In 1 Kings chapters 18 and 19, here was the lone prophet Elijah. And Elijah, this is like the original High Noon, if you've guys seen the old Western movie, where he faced down 400 prophets of Baal that were absolutely filled with demons. If you want to do a study of Baal, B-A-A-L, a horrifying demonic deity that had basically infiltrated the hearts of the people of Israel. And here he was on Mount Carmel, the only one he had on getting his back and backing him up was God himself. Tremendous courage. First Kings chapter 18, verse 27, it says, And at noon, these are the, uh, the, the 400 prophets of Baal who are trying to get their false god to answer by fire. And this is how much courage he had. Even the prophet, he mocked them saying, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing or he is. This is in the Bible. Or he is relieving himself. Or he is on a journey. It's in the Bible. Or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. Now imagine that level of trash talk and literally it's you versus 400 other guys. Oh, by the way, if you read the story, they all have knives. And in verse 38 of chapter 18, it says, and when all the people saw it, what did they see? They saw Baal not answer, but the God of the scriptures answered by fire to show that he was the one and only God. When the people saw that, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. I mean, you talk about power. You talk about faith. You talk about huge strength. Well, just the next chapter. It says in Ahab, this was the corrupt king of Israel during that time, told Jezebel, his wife, one of the most infamous characters in all the Bible, all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. This was capital uh, punishment. It was justice meted out against these 400 prophets of Baal that had made their living off of killing children. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. All right, now time out. In verse 3, before we get there, he had just taken on 400 prophets of Baal. They all had knives. And here is his response in verse 3. Then he was afraid. And he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die. Wait, this is the same guy. This is the same guy who incredible victory came through, saying, it is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. I don't know if he said, Lord, I can't sweep my feelings under the rug any longer. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. Now, do you see, just in a small period of time, he went from this victorious man of God over the forces of evil and injustice and hatred and wickedness and bloodshed to a man who was literally in fear for his life, even more than that, a man who wanted God to simply take his life. Literally, he had gone from being on the top of the mountain, literally and metaphorically, to not even wanting to live. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot coals and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. Do you see what God did by sending the angel? The angel did not give him a pep talk on how his theology needed to change. The angel said, Rise and eat something. Lay down and rest. There's a book on preaching that was written several years ago called Power in the Pulpit, in which the author makes this statement. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. Brothers and sisters, if Elijah, in God's word, can go from the greatest Super Bowl in that day and time for the glory of God to in the next few verses, 
despairing of life itself, you can imagine the emotional and the physical toll that that victory on top of Mount Carmel did on him. So we need to do an assessment of our life. Is, is it that I need to take another course in theology or is it that I need to first take a nap? Is it that I first need to do an assessment? Am I physically and am, am I emotionally exhausted? Because if we are, those feelings, not the intellectual doubts, but just the general feelings of doubt can begin to creep up in our soul. Another question that we want to ask is, do I feel abandoned by God? The story here in Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 6, is when John the Baptist had been thrown in prison by Herod for calling out Herod. And here's John the Baptist, an incredible, incredible man of God. I notice what he asks in prison. He says, now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Okay, time out. This is the same John the Baptist that when he first saw Jesus, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He knew who Jesus was, even when John the Baptist was in the womb. God had, had, had called him, had chosen him for a special work. So he's there in prison, he's on death row, and he sends his disciples just to say, ask Jesus again, just let's, uh, let's make sure that he's the real deal. And Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus is tapping back into the prophecies of Isaiah in chapter 29 and chapter 25 and chapter 61. John the Baptist being a practicing first century Palestinian Jew would have immediately connected what Jesus was saying. What Jesus is saying is the prophecies talk about all these things happening they are happening through me, so let the evidence of what's going on encourage you when you are there all alone in prison on death row. You see the humanness of John the Baptist. Now, we're not saying that John the Baptist was disbelieving Jesus or he was guilty of the sin of unbelief, but he was just saying, you know, I, I, I want to double check. I don't want to die for nothing if this is not the real thing. I don't want to take these shots on the chin if this is not for real. And the Bible says that John the Baptist was the greatest man born among women. So if he's there in prison and can have some, mm, I just want to make sure, then what makes you and I think that we can't sometimes experience the feelings of doubt. But notice how Jesus did not reprimand him. Jesus did not speak down to John. Jesus lovingly reminded him of what was actually true. And I believe that when we pursue our questions, we ask the Lord, he's able to respond to us in a way to, to help us have those anchors there. That even if the ship is in the middle of a hurricane in the middle of the North Atlantic, the anchor still holds. Another question when we're experiencing doubts about the Lord is, do I feel guilty because of an unconfessed sin or habit? Sin creates guilt. This is especially for, for a Christian who not only has their conscience, but they have the Holy Spirit indwelling them. If you're a Christian and you have fallen into or walked into a pattern of sin in your life, that's going to create guilt in your heart, and we don't like guilt. We talked about the guilt feelings back in week one. We talked about forgiving ourselves. We don't like those guilt feelings, so what we will tend to do is withdraw ourselves, as we saw from Barna's study. Sometimes we stop going to church. Sometimes we stop watching online. Other times we just don't want to talk about the things of the Lord anymore. We want to close our Bibles or take the Bible app off our phone or simply put it in a part of our phone that we don't normally access. We just don't want to be reminded of what tells us we need to repent and come back to the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, we ask the question, am I actually facing a really tough objection to Christianity? And brothers and sisters, I'll say this, in my own life and also talking to godly leaders who have helped people for many, many years with their doubts, that the overwhelming percentage of doubts that most of us experience 
are not intellectual in nature, but they are emotional in nature. Someone's going through marriage problems. They have an overbearing mom or dad. Or mom or dad are having marriage problems and you hear them fighting and threatening divorce. You lose your job. You lose a family member in in an untimely, shocking way. And all of those feelings that are natural for us to experience, sometimes those feelings can cause us to begin to sense a, 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 a separation from us and the Lord. And it's not that he's left, it's that we are hurting. But sometimes we don't know how to process that hurt. And then we'll actually say things like, well, I've been thinking... And then we'll bring up an intellectual objection to God. But it's not that we've been thinking, it's that we've been hurting, we've been feeling, we've been bleeding from the heart. But the only way we know how to articulate that is to do it in the form of, well, I'm not sure the Bible is the word of God. I'm not sure that the scientific evidence points towards a creator. And we, that's the way we articulate it. But I think the vast majority of what I've experienced talking to people in my life and talking, again, to godly leaders, smart people with degrees, helping people over a course of decades with their doubts and their questions, most all of them at at one point or another are affected by or rooted in something that we're walking through that's painful. So if we can identify the source of the doubt, then that will help us being able to remove that rock in our path as we pursue the Lord Jesus Christ. So if the question or the objection is intellectual in nature, here's what you want to do. You want to pursue it into the ground. Again, if it's the matter of, man, I'm absolutely exhausted. Here's your solution. This is where you want to start. Get some rest. Start obeying the Lord. Repent of workaholism. Some of us need to raise our hand, right? We, we just need to take time to make time to physically rest. And if all truth is God's truth, then you have nothing to fear from honestly pursuing your questions. There are some of us who have heard an objection to Christianity, and sometimes that creates a a profound sense of fear. We don't know what to do with that. What if it's right? Listen, if if all truth is God's truth, then we have nothing to fear to pursue those questions. Jude 22, and have mercy on those who doubt. Maybe some of you felt like that video, like that rock slide, that like the whole side of the mountain has slid off over the course of this year. And it's not just one rock, it's boulders upon boulders that are blocking your path. But as you pursue your questions, and we even have some resources there in the notes if you want to download that from the website or there on the app, uh, uh, some ways and resources that you can begin to pursue your questions. And again, we have a great team here, and we are here to help you and guide you with the questions that you may have. Even more so, we do something called Deep Dive at 5 every week now on Wednesday evenings at 5 p.m. to we take what we talk about on Sunday and go a little deeper and apply it uh, a bit more extensive. We have this photo here that illustrates what God can begin to do in our lives. When sometimes it feels like the the road, the complete uh, interstate of our life, uh, helping us get to God is covered up by all of these experiences and hurts and doubts, God can, through his spirit and through you being willing to try to analyze your doubts and where they come from, following the leading of the Holy Spirit, rock by rock, Boulder by boulder, he can put that in the dump truck and haul it off so that your pathway can become clear to following him in a meaningful, real way. And all we're doing here this morning is trying to remove rocks. But even when this road becomes completely clear, even when the rest of what's blocking this one lane here is removed, and you can have both lanes full capacity... All that is is removing rocks, but it's up to you and the Lord of whether or not you'll actually travel with him on his way. He will lead you to himself, but it is up to you to follow him. In Mark chapter 9, there was a man whose son had suffered incredibly. And Jesus told the man, he said, all things are possible for one who believes. What Jesus was saying is that I will do a great thing in your life. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, 
help my unbelief. I think many of us could say that at many times in our lives. Say, Lord, I believe in who you are. But as far as walking down that road and, and, and getting back on the path of where I need to be, Lord, help my unbelief. We're going to sing a song called Yes, I Will. And I pray that that is your prayer today. If you have questions, if you have objections, whether they're intellectual or whether you think that some of them are coming from a painful experience in the past or what you're walking through right now, I want you to, to take a step today. I want you to fill out that connect card. I want you to take a step in faith. And if you have maybe a rock or a boulder or a pebble or a pile of rocks there in your life, we want to help you uh, remove those rocks. But again, at the end of the day, it's up to you to follow to take that step of faith, even when the road is clear. Just because it's clear doesn't mean that we'll walk it, but Jesus Christ is calling us to a deeper way of living, to follow him. I pray that you will, for his glory and for your good. I can own one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will. Yes, I will lift you up in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will. Sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I Thank you so much for being with us at Grace Fellowship at Church for All Nations Online for our series, Asking for a Friend. If you know that you have a need for Jesus Christ in your life, if you know you have that desire to be right with God, I would encourage you right now to reach out from your heart in faith to Him and experience His cleansing and His forgiveness by turning away from your sin and placing your faith and your trust and your confidence in Jesus and in Jesus Christ alone. And if you're willing to make that step towards Him, would you let us know? We get so excited about life change and we are serious and committed to helping you on your faith journey. If you have a question about baptism or you want to learn more about Grace Fellowship and how to be plugged in here, let us know through the Connect card. If you're a follower of Christ and you want to help just drive the mission of Jesus Christ forward, there are some things that you can do. Number one, you can share this content. You can bring people with you on Sunday morning if you're comfortable being in our in-person services. And then third, you can give as the Lord leads you to give. Guys, I believe that God has great things in store for us. So let's continue to make much of Him by inviting our friends and our family who may have questions and who may say, asking for a friend. At Grace Fellowship at Church for All Nations, we're going to ask the questions and answer them from a biblical perspective. May the Lord bless you, and we look forward to seeing you next week.